The caption for this photo, which was on the NPR website, was, Katanji Brown Jackson sworn in as the first black woman on the Supreme Court. Do you remember back in March during the second day of her Supreme Court confirmation hearings? Judge Jackson helplessly refused to define what a woman is. Senator Marsha Blackburn asked her to define the word woman, and Brown replied, I can't. I'm not a biologist. Blackburn shot back, the meaning of the word woman is so unclear and controversial that you can't give me a definition? And Jackson replied, Senator, in my work as judge, what I do is address disputes. If there's a dispute about a definition, people make arguments, and I look at the law, and I decide. And Senator Blackburn responded, the fact that you can't give me a straight answer about something as fundamental as what a woman is underscores the dangers of the kind of progressive education that we are hearing about. We live in a day where new speak from George Orwell's 1984 seems to be the norm. Words that we clearly understood for most of our history, words like marriage, man, woman, murder, are all being redefined or just undefined. And words like right, wrong, sin, God, are close to being removed from use altogether. These are difficult days to be a student when so many institutions are farther and farther to the left, even of where our culture and where our society is. There are also difficult days for educators who are followers of Jesus Christ. We need to clearly understand truth and the sources of truth and what authority is. And as I prayed earlier, we need to keep our schools and our students in our prayers, helping them to define truth through the lens of God's word. One of our core values as a church is to teach a biblical worldview that when we hear the news, we think about what does God say about this? Does God define things differently than we're hearing? And this is always the standard. This doesn't change. God's word is eternal. In today's message, Jesus is confronted by religious leaders, the Jewish politicians of the day, and they challenged his source of authority. Jesus masterfully makes them look foolish yet again. They were looking for an opportunity to attack him, to destroy him, But Jesus came out the winner. If you've been with us before, you'll recognize the crown and the cross. That's a series we've been going through in the Gospel of Mark. And those of you who wonder if it will ever come to an end, it will. We're already in Holy Week, so you know that the Gospel story will come to an end soon. We have a couple more chapters, but I want to get everything out of this that we can. So we're going to take our time as we continue through the Gospel of Mark. Mark's gospel shows Jesus as a man with a clear message and a clear mission. And the reader of that day and of today is called to respond to what Jesus says. Jesus is a man of action, and he knows what he's doing, and he knows what he's called to do. He calls his followers to follow him in doing the same thing, so that we can better understand God's heart. In the first half of Mark, the emphasis was on Jesus being revealed as the Messiah, the one who is rightfully to wear the crown. And then through this Holy Week, as we call it, we see him headed towards the cross where he's going to fulfill his mission, not to be seated on the throne of Israel literally in that day, but to conquer death, to conquer the grave, to provide a final sacrifice, to provide peace with God, and to usher in the kingdom that will eventually come and restore all of God's creation. In the last two sermons, we saw Jesus harshly judging the temple and the religious leaders because of their unfruitful worship. And Jesus also, as a symbol of that, harshly judged the fig tree, He saw leaves and life, but no fruit. So as that fig tree withered and died, Jesus was prophesying that the temple and these religious leaders would wither and die. 
This whole sacrificial system was being replaced by the final Passover lamb, the final sacrifice, and that was going to be himself. So today we're finishing chapter 11, and our parallel passages are Matthew 21 and Luke 20. If you like following along with notes, you can find a note sheet in your bulletin. There's some blanks to fill in and some places where you can jot down some thoughts along the way. First, I'd like to read the passage, but let's pray and ask God's blessing as we read his word. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this morning. Thank you that we could come to the communion table and recognize how you were rejected by heaven and earth as you went to the cross. You fulfilled God's requirement, his penalty for sin. You paid that awful payment with your own life. Thank you, Jesus, for saving us. Thank you for offering us not only forgiveness, but peace with your heavenly Father. Lord, as we read your word today, as we continue to read the gospel account of Jesus from Mark, I pray that you would give us open ears and open hearts to hear what you have to say, that our lives would be different because we've heard your word, and that you'd help us to be followers of you that become more and more like your son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name I pray. Amen. Mark chapter 11, verses 27 to 33. And they came again to Jerusalem. And as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him. And they said to him, by what authority are you doing these things? Or who gave you this authority to do them? Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question. Answer me. And I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? Answer me. And they discussed it with one another, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why then did you not believe him? But shall we say from man? They were afraid of the people, for they had all held that John really was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Our outline is following what happens in Scripture. I'm not that clever to come up with all the things that rhyme with each other or start with the same letter, so I'm just telling you what I find in Scripture. First, we see Jesus, the Jewish leaders, challenge Jesus, verses 27 to 28. As I said, this is now Holy Week, the seven days from Jesus' triumphal entry, the day we call Palm Sunday, to his death on the cross, and then finally Easter, when he rose from the dead. So yesterday in this week, Jesus entered the temple, he threw the animals out, he threw out the money changers, and he said, this temple is a house of prayer for all nations. It's not a marketplace, it's not a thoroughfare. This is a holy place. And now the next day, our passage tells us, Jesus came back to Jerusalem. So it's Tuesday in Holy Week. And he's walking through the temple again. And a group of religious leaders came to challenge him. It told, tells us specifically that it's the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. And those are the three groups that make up the Sanhedrin. It's a council of 71 men who have almost total freedom when it comes to religious matters. They were in charge of the temple. They're the ones that Jesus is challenging when he says, you're not using the temple properly. You're not treating it as the house of God, a house of worship, a house of prayer. They had complete religious power and freedom, but they had very little political power. They acted like a buffer between Rome, the invading nation, and the Jewish people. But this would have been a smaller group or a delegation from the Sanhedrin. It wasn't all 71 men surrounding Jesus and asking him. They, they sent a group to ask him, just as they did a number of times where we read that the Pharisees or the scribes or others went out and kind of spied on Jesus, listened to his message, and then they challenged him at different times. The approach and the question from the Sanhedrin show us that what was really the problem for them was the issue of Jesus' authority. 
That's what they were most concerned about. Who told you you could say these things? Who told you you could come into our temple and kick out the money changers, chase the animals out, throw over tables? Who told you you could do that? The chief priests and the scribes we read in the previous passage, it says they were looking for a way to destroy him after he did that because they were afraid of him. One man, they were afraid of him. His teachings and his actions were a direct threat to their power, their position in society, the power they held over the people. And so they asked, by what authority are you doing these things? Or who gave you the authority? Who gave you the right to come into our house and say this, to tell us how to act, to tell us what to do? These things, who gave you the authority to do these things? It certainly applies to the cleansing of the temple, but it would also include Jesus' power to heal the sick. His authority to forgive sinners. His commands over the demons to cast them out. His teachings to re redefine the Sabbath and say the Sabbath is for recognizing who God is. It's not a day to just make a bunch of laws and make yourself look good. The call to repentance that he echoed that John made rather than offering up more sin sacrifices. God cares about the heart and he calls you to repentance. Yes, we have a sacrificial system, but what I really care about is are you repenting? Are you coming to God with a desire to stop sinning? The scribes, the Pharisees have been asking these kind of questions throughout Jesus' ministries. But now that he's on their home territory, their turf, the temple in Jerusalem, they feel very threatened. Who are you to come into our house and tell us this? So Jesus asks a question, verses 29 to 30. He responds in typical fashion. When someone asks him a question, what does Jesus do? He asks a question back. He gives them an opportunity to clarify what they've asked, to think about what they've asked. And this is not just Jesus being a smart aleck. This is what rabbis did. When someone asked them questions, they responded with a question. He wasn't trying to avoid answering it. He's making a counterpart or a counterpoint to their question about his authority. So his question is, was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? Answer me. It's not a hypothetical question. He says, answer me. Was John's authority from heaven or earth? And he called for a response. He's taken control of this situation. You answer me, and then I'll answer you. When Jesus said heaven, he literally meant God, because the Jews typically would never even speak the name God. If you've read any Jewish writings, it's G-D. They won't even write out the complete name of God out of reverence and awe for God. So they wouldn't speak his name in public like that. So they would say heaven. Heaven represents God. Was John's authority from God? Or was it just from himself or someone else that said, John, why don't you go out and start baptizing people? Jesus is asking about John's authority. The call to repentance. The call to be baptized is a symbol of that. God's offer of forgiveness. All of those things. Who gave John the authority to call people to repentance, to call people to be baptized. And John proclaimed that Jesus was the Messiah. Here he comes. The Lamb of God is approaching. I'm not even worthy to stoop down and fasten his sandals. There he is, the Son of God. If that's John's authority, then this must be the Messiah. So Jesus really gave them a good question because it defined his authority. If they could answer that question, they could answer their own question. Where's Jesus' authority from? Sadly, the religious leaders can't respond, just like Katanji Jackson Brown. I can't answer that question, because 
if I say the truth, there's going to be a bunch of people mad at me. And if I don't answer it, then I'm just going to look foolish. I can't define, I just don't know. They discuss the question among themselves for a while, trying to find a reasonable answer. And we hear their deliberations. We have in the gospel account what they discussed and as they argued and talked about it. So they said, if we say John's authority is from heaven, if we say God authorized him as a prophet, then Jesus is going to say, why didn't you believe him? If this is the prophet from God, why did you ignore his message? And why don't you believe in me, the Messiah? But if we say John's authority was simply from man, it was just himself saying his own thoughts, his own ideas, the people are going to hate us because they really believe that John was a prophet. We can't win either way. So their official answer, is this your final answer? No, we don't know. The reason they couldn't answer was not because they weren't smart enough, but because of their stubborn wills. They stood self-condemned. Jesus' question was not a trap. It was really another opportunity for them to realize, to confess their blindness, to ask for sight. By asking them about John, Jesus went back to the beginning of his ministry and said, here's where something new is happening. This is the first time God has spoken in 400 plus years. The first prophet to show up to Israel. If you go back to that point and say, yes, we believe, then God can do a work in your heart. You can affirm what God is doing now instead of trying to fight against it. Jesus really was giving them a second chance. It was an opportunity to repent to recognize the truth, but sadly, they refused. The Sanhedrin certainly remembered John's powerful preaching, calling the Jews to repentance and his insistence that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. The link between Jesus and John clearly pointed to Jesus' own identity and his authority. And as he demanded a response from them, some kind of commitment one way or the other, they just couldn't do it because they loved the praise of the people. They loved their power. They didn't want to make the people mad and lose their position. But if they said, yes, John was speaking from God, yes, you are the Messiah, then their hearts would have to change. And they didn't want to do that. They couldn't do that. The religious leaders just couldn't evaluate the evidence that God placed before them. They had John, who conformed to all of the Old Testament expectations of the prophet, the one who would come before the Messiah to make the crooked ways straight, to be the messenger, as Isaiah spoke about. And then all of the messianic promises that Jesus had brought forth making the deaf hear, the blind see, the crippled walk, hearing the voice of God from heaven saying, this is my beloved son. They denied all of that. They even ascribed Jesus casting out of demons to the devil because they wouldn't believe that he was sent from God, that he was God. The relationship between the religious leaders and Jesus had reached the pinnacle, the final point of alienation. There was no turning back from this point. And because they were basically politicians, they wanted to balance the interests of the people and the Roman authorities. So when they're thinking, we have to go with the popular opinion, we have to keep the people happy, we have to keep the peace, we don't want to make a statement that would cause all of that to go away for us. We do not know. So what's Jesus' final word? What's his response in verse 33? Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Since neither option was acceptable to the Sanhedrin, and they pleaded ignorance, 
just so they could save face? Jesus wasn't obligated to answer their question. He said, if you answer mine, I can answer yours. And really, in answering his question, they answered it. They clearly recognized that he was the Son of God, but they wouldn't admit it. They wouldn't let that truth be true to them. They rejected John. They rejected Jesus as God's messengers. And throughout history, most of Israel rejected the prophets. If you look back to the prophets coming on the scene, their messages were not popular. Repent, turn away from your sins, stop being hypocrites. Nobody wants to hear that. Do people want to hear that today? Do people want to hear that sin is sin and that God doesn't love and accept everything you do or think? Nobody wants to hear that. People want to hear God loves you no matter what. Just keep doing what you're doing and he'll let you in because he's a big grandfather in the sky and it's all good. If that were true, that God was simply just this benign, loving grandfather in the sky, would Jesus have gone to the cross? Would that loving grandfather sent his son to suffer and die for your sins and mine? We can't have both things. We can't have Jesus, the truth of Jesus dying on the cross for our sins, and God's love applies simply to everybody across the board. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, He did love the world, He does love the world, but He had to send His only Son to die on the cross for your sins and mine. That's the only way that we could be right with God. The next time that Jesus will stand before the Sanhedrin, he also will not answer them. When he's on trial before Pilate, and we're going to get to that at the, towards the end of Holy Week, I won't answer you since you won't answer me. Jesus was not afraid to answer them, but he said, I'm not going to answer that question because you can't answer mine. And then at Matthew 28, at the very end of Matthew's gospel, Jesus is preparing to go to heaven. He's giving his disciples their marching orders. We often call this the Great Commission. And he said to the disciples, go out and make more disciples, baptize them, teach them to obey my word. But first Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So when he asked that question, or when they asked that question, is your authority from heaven or earth? Just like John, Jesus said, it's all mine. I've been authorized by heaven and earth. All authority is given to me. Jesus knew that his ministry came from his father. And throughout his ministry, he continued to pray to his father and say, your will, not mine. We recognize his humanity because going to the cross was going to be painful. Being rejected by his friends, rejected by his nation rejected by his father was the worst thing that Jesus could endure. And he prayed in tears, if there's any other way, but your will, not mine. Are you willing to pray that God to God? I don't want to lose this person in my life. I don't want to lose this good job. I don't want to lose these friends. I don't want to look silly in front of my coworkers when I say, Yes, I believe in Jesus. Yes, I believe this is true. Are you willing to suffer rejection like Jesus did for the sake of the Father, for the sake of the truth? The Jewish leaders were caught in a dilemma. They weren't asking what is true or what is right. They wanted to know what's safe. What's the safe answer? What's the thing that we could say that would keep us in our positions, but leave us looking okay. That's always the approach of a hypocrite, of a crowd pleaser. Certainly not the approach of Jesus or John the Baptist. They both lost their lives for speaking the truth and not willing to go back and say, I'll just tell you what you want to hear. Jesus didn't refuse to answer their question. He just refused to accept or to endorse their hypocrisy. 
He wasn't being evasive. He was being honest. Did you listen as Jake was reading Ephesians 1 for us? God placed Jesus far above all other rule and authority. He placed all things under his feet and he appointed him as head over everything in the church. Jesus Christ, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and all authority belongs to him. Our takeaway questions this morning. I'm not going to ask you to define a woman, but I'm going to ask you to answer this question. It's the most important question in all of your life. Who is Jesus Christ? Can you answer that question truthfully, honestly? That's the question as you stand before God as your judge. That if you don't have the right answer, you'll spend eternity separated from Him. If you don't trust in Jesus Christ as Savior, if you haven't repented of your sins, then God says, you can't be right with me. You can't enter my heaven. You can't spend eternity with me because you didn't recognize who Jesus Christ is. Notice I didn't say was, because he still is. He is the Son of God. He is the Messiah. He is alive. And he is seated at the right hand of God the Father. Have you repented of your sins? Have you told God that you can't be good enough for heaven? That the only way you can be right with him is to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. To believe that he died on the cross for your sins and that he rose again, offering you eternal life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus didn't say, if you find some other religious leader that you like better, go ahead and follow him, that's fine. Jesus didn't say, you can find God in nature and just worship him by enjoying the things he created. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the only source of eternal life. That's exclusive. And our world doesn't want to hear anything exclusive. We want everything to be available to everyone all the time. But that's not the way God created reality. You can't have yes and no at the same time. Black is not white and white is not black. Right is not wrong, and wrong doesn't become right for you. There's right, and there's wrong. There's truth, and there are lies. And Jesus said, I am truth. So if you're looking for truth in this world, if you're trying to figure out who do we believe, what do we believe, we can't believe the news, we can't believe politicians, we can believe God, and we can always believe His Word. So if you're wondering What's right? Go to God's word. Let that be your guide. Let this be your moral compass. Not me, because I'm going to make mistakes. I'll, I'll tell you to do the wrong thing at some point. I don't want to, but I'm human. Go to God's word. And that's why we come together as believers in a church. We want to learn what does it say and how do we live it out together? How do we encourage each other when it's so hard to do the right thing? How can we boost each other up, put an arm around each other, cry with each other, rejoice with each other, go through life together? That's what the church is. And Jesus said, I'm the head of the church. It's not me. It's Jesus. And we seek to follow him. If you've accepted Christ as Savior, then like the religious leaders, do you find yourself guilty of hypocrisy? Do you sometimes say one thing but do another? Do you hold others to a higher standard than yourself? Do you quickly judge other people? Do you refuse to show them the grace, the mercy, the forgiveness that Jesus has shown you? Are you a people pleaser who cares more about what people think than what God thinks or says is right. 
Here are some symptoms that I know I'm guilty of. Do you have trouble disagreeing? Do you apologize constantly? Do you have too many things on your plate that someone else could be doing? Are you uncomfortable when others disagree with you? Do you avoid conflict at any cost? Do you want people to always like you? Are you more worried about what people think about you than what you think is right? Do you have a hard time saying no? Some of these things we just want to be agreeable. But if you find yourself answering or acting because you're more worried about what someone's going to say or think than what God does, you might be a people pleaser. If you're in public, are you more worried about public opinion and how that's more important perhaps than God's truth and his standards? James 4.17 gives us this powerful reminder. Whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. We can't stand back and watch wrongs happen. We have to step up when it's the right time. Don't avoid speaking the truth or standing up for what is right because it's not popular. In Ephesians 4.15, we're called to speak the truth out of love for others. So we can become people who always speak the truth and you say, I always have to say what I'm thinking, but you might not be doing that in love. You may not be doing that to draw people closer to Jesus. You may be doing it just because you want to be right. Pride is one of our deepest sins. We want others to think well of us. Jesus was more concerned about doing the will of the Father than pleasing the religious leaders of the day, than even making the crowd happy with him. There were times that Jesus walked away from the crowd because he knew that they were just after political strength or more food. He wasn't worried about pleasing the crowd. He was worried always or concerned with pleasing his Father. And he did that till the very end as he hung on the cross. As he rose from the grave, he pleased his heavenly Father. And that's what he calls us to do as his followers. Live a life that's pleasing to your heavenly Father. Live a life that honors Jesus Christ, that honors his rejection for you and for me. Tim is going to come in a moment and sing a final song with us. Thank you for the songs you picked this morning. They just worked so beautifully with our communion time and as we close. But let me pray before Tim comes and sings. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that Jesus came as your ambassador, your messenger of truth, that he came to show us what it looks like to live a life totally pleasing to you, totally sold out to you. Heavenly Father, give us the strength and courage to stand up for what's truth, what is true. Give us the courage to do what's right. And most of all, help us to honor you and your son, Jesus Christ in all that we say and do. Lord, I pray that if there's anyone this morning that hasn't correctly answered that question, who is Jesus, they're still struggling with understanding who you are. I pray that today would be the day that they would come to know you as Lord and Savior, the one with authority over heaven and earth. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace. May he comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. In the everlasting, matchless name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.